Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff. So I'm picking up here in part two of chapter 12 with the special senses. We'll begin here on page 467. Gravity stimulates those hair cells to respond. And this happens when your head bends forward, side to side, or even backward. So as those hair movements, excuse me, as those movements of the head occurs and stimulates those hair cells to respond, what happens is, is that gelatinous mass of maculae, they begin to move because of gravity, and then those hairs project onto it, they begin to bend. So as it happens, this causes those hair cells to signal the neuron. That signal, of course, is then conducted into the central nervous system by way of the vestibular branch and the vestibular cochlear nerve, letting the brain know where your head is in position. As the brain responds, it will adjust the pattern of those motor impulses sent to your skeletal muscles. In other words, they may contract or relax to appropriately remain proper balance. And this happens, I say, ever so quickly, and is the way that we keep our heads upright, and especially how you're seeing the screen right now. So next of which, we'll get to sense and balance. So those maculae, they also participate in the sense of dynamic equilibrium. So when your head or body is thrust forward or backward abruptly, that gelatinous mass again with the macula, it lags behind and the hair cells are then stimulated. So this is how the maculae aid the brain in, in detecting movements such as you falling or just maintaining your posture as you walk. Now to dynamic equilibrium. So this, that is dynamic equilibrium, involves movement. So what we have here is those, the semicircular canal, by way of those three bony semicircular canals, they lie at right angles. And with this, we have what is called the ampulla, meaning within which is what is called the paralymph, because within the paralymph of the bony canal is what we call the ampulla. If you look closely, you'll see figure 12.17, which is what I referred to. So the ampullae, they communicate with the utricle of the vestibule. And with that, the ampulla has that ridge that crosses the tube. And each of these organs are called crista ampullaris. So the crista ampullaris, this is what has those sensory hair cells. And what happens is that dome-shaped cupula and those hair cells of the, of the crista ampullaris are connected to part of their bases, by one of those dendrites, the neuron. So when the head or torso moves in that, in that, the semicircular canals, they also move. But initially the fluid inside the membrane tends to remain stationary, and this is all because of inertia. Meaning, if you were to turn quite rapidly while holding a, a glass full of water, or this cup full of water such as in front of me right now, you would notice that as soon as you turn, the water stays there, and then it moves. So this bends the cupula in one or more of those semicircular canals in the opposite direction of the head and torso. So by moving those hairs, it stimulates those hairs to signal the associated neurons. And as a result, the impulses are then conducted to the brain. Movements in different directions affect different combinations of semicircular canals. So the brain interprets those impulses as originated from these different combinations, as, of course, different movements. So if you look closely, your head is still. As soon as your head moves, we then, of course, get that movement. As I just mentioned, there is a lag. And that, that small lag in the fluid is that very reason why. Part of the cellar belt are particularly important in interpreting impulses from the semicircular canals. Analysis of such information allows the brain to predict the consequences of those rapid body movements. This is where it gets quite amazing. So when that happens is it modifies those signals to your skeletal muscles and the cerebellum can maintain proper balance. Other sensory structures also aid in maintaining equilibrium. So we have proprioceptors and especially those joints, particularly the joints of the neck, they inform the brain about the position of those body parts. Our eyes also detect changes in points of reference that result from body movements. And that visual information 
is so important that even if the organs of equilibrium are damaged, keeping your eyes open and moving slowly may be sufficient in, in maintaining normal balance. Last of the last is going to be motion sickness. So it's thought to result when those visual information, meaning what you see, contradicts the inner ear sensation when he or she is moving. And for instance, if you're reading in the car, if ever you read in the car, what happens is that the inner ear says you're moving as the car responds to those turns, the change in speed, and of course, uneven road surfaces. But the eyes are following the lines of the book. So that, of course, is what seems to be motionless. So that is another example, of course, of what you see, not, of course, lining up with what you're experiencing. So the brain reacts to those seemingly contradictory sensations by the feelings of nausea. So that's the definition of motion sickness. When you have that sensory input, that does not match. It's a mismatch in such thing. What I'll get to now is going to be deafness. So I've mentioned deafness before, but do keep in mind that it could be either a conduction deafness, when something hampers the sound conduction to the fluids of the inner ear, or it could be sensorineural deafness, which results from damage to the neural structures at any point from the cochlear hairs to and including the auditory cortical cells. So we have next up tinnitus. That's that ringing or buzzing or even that clicking in the ears in the absence of auditory stimuli, typical of which is for this to be called a, a symptom, not a disease. So this might be one of the first symptoms of cochlear nerve degeneration, and it signals that inflammation, meaning it may also signal, excuse me, inflammation of the middle ear or inner ear, and a side effect of some medications such as aspirin. Up next is Meniere's syndrome. Meniere syndrome is a labyrinth disorder that seems to affect all three parts of the inner ear. So someone with it may have repeated attacks, repeated spells of vertigo, nausea, and vomiting. Balance is also disturbed in that standing straight up is nearly impossible, and hearing may be impaired or lost completely. Along the way, mild cases of Meniere syndrome can be treated by anti-motion drugs, a low-sodium diet, and diuretics to decrease to decrease, excuse me, endolymph fluid volume, and in severe cases, draining excess endolymph from the inner ear may help. As a last result, it may also lead to someone having to have the entire malfunctioning labyrinth removed. So from here, I'll move on to the sense of sight. To start this portion of the chapter, I'll begin with just making sure you know that we have those visual, recept visual receptors and our visual receptors are found in the eye. So as we have this, this sense of sight, it has a number of accessory organs. They include the upper and lower eyelids, the lacrimal appar apparatus, and of course, they help protect the eyes and, and a set of six extrinsic eye muscles that move the eyes. So let's move on to what's next. So the upper and lower eyelids, also known as the palpebrae, are there for protection. Eyelashes are too there for protection. The lacrimal apparatus is there for tear production. And you all likely know very well that the extrinsic eye muscle, the extrinsic eye muscles are there for the movement of the eyes. The eyelids are anterior to the eye and protected by the eyelids are anteriorly to the eyes, which of course are there for protection. You can also call the eyelids the palpebrae, as I just mentioned, one of which we would call a palpebra. So they meet at the medial and lateral angles of the eye, and the medial commissure sports that fleshy elevation called the lacrimal caruncle. The lacrimal caruncle. So if you look, if you were to look medially, and you see that portion, it's just that bit of flesh that's right in the center and it will be lateral to the medial commissure. So if you look closely, you'll see what I'm referring to. Just a bit, of course, in figure 12.23. As I state this, the cardinal contains sebaceous glands and sweat glands and produce this whitish oily secretion. This is why sometimes they say somebody has the Sandman's 
eye sand, or even the matter in your eye, that sometimes collects at the meter commissure, and especially when you wake up. And it states here in the text, in most Asian peoples, this vertical fold of skin, called the epicanthic fold, commonly appears on both sides of the nose and sometimes covers the meter commissure. So the eyelids, they are thin, and they, they have the skin-covered folds, and they're supported internally by connective tissue seats called tarsal plates. So the tarsal plates anchor the orbicularis oculi and the levator palpebrae superioris muscles that run within the eye itself, the eyebrows themselves. They're short, coarse hairs. They overlie the supraorbital margins of the skull, and they help shade the eyes from sunlight and, of course, prevent perspiration from trickling down the forehead and reaching the eyes. So with that, I'll move on to the eyelashes. So as I get to the eyelashes, as they are there for us, I'll state that the follicles of the eyelash are richly innervated by nerve endings called hair follicle receptors, and anything that touches the eyelids of eyelashes, and anything that touches the eyelashes, it of course then causes the reflexive blinking. And even if it's just a puff of air that you may have experienced, we have the tarsal glands. The tarsal glands secrete oil onto the, eyelash, onto the eyelashes. So their ducts open at the eyelid, just posterior to the eyelashes. And these modify so they gland with their oily secretion. It lubricates the eyelid and the eye, preventing the eyes from sticking together. I would not want eyelids to, to, to stick together. And if that happens to occur, you just might have pink eye, the calisian. So this is an infection that occurs of the tarsal gland, which results in an unsightly cyst. And if you have inflammation of any of the smaller glands, it's called a sty which you've likely seen a person with a sty before once in life. Next up is the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is a transparent mucous membrane, and it lines the eyelids as the palpable and conjunctiva, and then it folds back and on the anterior surface of the eyeball. And this conjunctiva, the bulbar conjunctiva, only covers the white of the eye and not the cornea. Not the cornea, excuse me, the cornea. So the bulbar conjunctiva is very thin, and blood vessels are clearly visible beneath it, even more vis visible in those irritated bloodshot eyes. So when the eyelids are closed, the slit-like space occurs between the conjunctiva covered eyeball and eyelids. This is so-called the conjunctival sac. So the conjunctival sac is where your contact lenses rest. And the very same way, this is where eye medications are placed, meaning as you administer the eye medication, you, inferior, you in, administer it to the inferior surface. And the major function of the conjunctiva, as I said earlier, is to ensure that your eyes do not dry out. The lacrimal apparatus consists of the lacrimal gland and the ducts that drain the lacrimal secretions into the nasal cavity. The lacrimal gland, which is here, continuously releases a dilute saline solution Call it that lacrimal secretion, or more commonly, tears. So it's released in that superior part of the conjunctival sac, and then from there it goes through several small excretory ducts. It's so amazing how this occurs. So blinking then spreads the tears downward across the eyeball to the medial commissure where they enter into the lacrimal canaliculi. The lacrimal fluid contains mucus, antibodies, and lysozymes. To help you out, what lysozyme does is it destroys bacteria. Hence, it cleanses and protects the eye surface as it moistens and lubricates it. So when the lacrimal secretion increases substantially, tears fill over the eyelids and fill the nasal cavities, causing the congestion and the sniffles. No, I don't have the sniffles. So this spillover or tearing happens when the eyes are irritated or when we are emotionally upset. In the case of eye irritation, the enhanced tearing washes away or dilutes the irritating substance. So the importance of emotionally induced tears is not well understood. So amazing. So when a person cries, it is parasympathetic nerve fibers 
and that conduct those motor impulses to those lacrimal, gla lacrimal glands. How amazing it is. So thanks a lot, Lysozyme, for reducing the risk of eye infections. Next up, excuse me, I'll get down into because the nasal, ca the nasal ca cavity mucosa is continuous with that of the lacrimal duct, a cold or nasal inflammation causes the lacrimal mucosa to swell, and this swelling constricts and prevents tears from draining, causing those watery eyes you all may have experienced. Next up, I'll get down to ex extrinsic eye muscles. Um, that is the way our eyes move with these six strap-like muscles. It is important to know we have six of those. They are among the most precisely and rapidly controlled skeletal muscles in the body. So the precision of those reflects their high axon to muscle fiber ratio, meaning the motor units of these muscles contain only 8 to 12 muscle cells, and in some cases, only as few as 2 or 3. So I'll next get to another application in the clinic. And I'll mention this is when the eye movements meaning the movements of those extrinsic eye muscles of the two eyes are not perfectly coordinated, a person cannot properly focus on images of the same area in the visual field from each eye, so that person sees two images instead of one. This is called diplopia. So diplopia, or double vision, can result from paralysis or weakness of certain extrinsic eye muscles, or even a neurological disorder. Congenital weakness of the external eye muscles may cause estrabismus. If a person has a strabismus, a strabismus, excuse me, in which the affected eye rotates either medially or laterally, you may also have heard someone to be termed to being cross-eyed. To compensate, the eyes may alternate in focusing on objects, and in other cases, only the controllable eyes used. The brain begins to disregard those inputs from that deviant eye, which, unless treated early, can then become functionally blind. So from here, I'll get to structure of the eye. So as I do eyeball structure, I'll take my time and begin with those three tunics. So we have that fibrous or outer tunic, vascular or middle tunic, and the inner called nervous tunic. So the hollow spherical organ of eyesight, the eyeball it is. So the outer tunic, the fibrous tunic, it's composed of, it says, dense avascular connective tissue. So this dense, I repeat, avascular connective tissue has two parts. It's known as the sclera and cornea. So I'll keep this as concise as I can keep it, you all. The sclera, seen anteriorly as the white of the eye, it's tough and tendon-like sclera that protects and shapes the eyeball itself. So this is what anchors those six extrinsic eye muscles. And then posteriorly, where the sclera is pierced by the optic nerve, that's cranial nerve number two, it is continuous with the dura mater of the brain. The cornea. The cornea is modified to form that transparent portion, meaning whereas the sclera takes up a greater portion of the eye, the cornea only takes up that anterior sixth of the fibrous layer. So the cornea is what bulges out anteriorly from the junction with the sclera, being that latter five-sixths, or that posterior five-sixths of the eye, is what forms, meaning that crystal clear cornea, window that lets light enter the eye. So it's that major part of the light bending apparatus of the eye. So with that, I guess I'll get to the next portion here. It's cells, meaning the cells of the cornea. They have active sodium pumps to maintain the clarity of the cornea by keeping its water content metal, low. Excuse me. So the cornea is supplied pretty well with the nerve endings, and most of which are pain receptors. So this is why people cannot tolerate, meaning some cannot tolerate contact lenses. The cornea, meaning if it's touched, blinking and increased tearing occur reflexively. Even so, the cornea is the most exposed part of the eye and is vulnerable to damage from dust, slivers, and things as such. So luckily, it can regenerate and repair itself extraordinarily. Excuse me, the cornea has no blood vessels because I said earlier, this fibrous layer is avascular. 
the cornea has no blood vessels. So it's, it is beyond the reach of the immune system, meaning as a result, the cornea is the only tissue in the body that can be transplanted, that can be transplanted from one person to an, another with little risk of rejection. Next, I'll get to the middle layer, that vascular layer. Here, I have what is called the choroid, the ciliary body, as well as the iris. I'll begin, firstly, with the choroid. The choroid, and let me go back for just a moment. This is that middle vascular layer, so I hope it's strikingly obvious that now it has vascular tissues. So what I mentioned here now is that the choroid is a blood vessel rich dark brown membrane and it forms the posterior five sixths of the vascular layer. So the blood vessels here nourish all eye layers. Its brown pigment is produced by monocytes, help absorb light and preventing it from scattering and reflecting within the eye. If that were to happen, you will be visually confused and not be able to see. So the choroid has a posterior, I repeat, it has a posterior opening, and this is where the optic nerve leaves the eye. The ciliary body, anteriorly, the choroid becomes a ciliary body. So I say again, the ciliary body is what, of course, is anterior, anterior to the choroid. So that's that one-sixth portion of the eye by way of the vascular layer. So it's a thickening ring of tissue that encircles the lens. The ciliary body consists mostly of what is called smooth muscle bundles, called ciliary muscles. This is what controls the shape of your lens class. The ciliary zonule, which is a suspensory, a suspensory ligament. So this is what extends from the ciliary processes, which control the lens shape, and this halo of fine fibers and circles to help hold the lens in its upright position. Now that I'm at the iris, it's a, well, I'll say it, it's the colored part of the eye and the most anterior portion of this, this middle vascular layer. So the posterior portion being the choroid, what's anterior to the choroid is the ciliary body, and the most anterior portion is the iris. So it's shaped like a flattened donut. Yes, I said donut. It lies between the cornea and the lens is, and then is continuous with the ciliary body, posterior. So its round central opening is known as the pupil. So it allows light into the eye. The iris is made up of two muscle layers with bundles of sticky elastic fibers that of course develop into a random pattern before birth. So its muscle fibers allow it to reflexively activate the diaphragm to vary pupil size. So please keep taking notes and pay close attention. So this picture, of course, shows where I've been. And now I'll get to it a, a bit more, I guess I'll say, specifically. So in close vision and bright light, the sphincter pupillae, I repeat, the circular muscles called sphincter pupillae contracts and the pupil constricts. This is important. Learn this. This is important. Please, class, learn this. So I say again, in close vision and bright light, the sphincter pupillae, the circular smooth muscles, contract and the pupil constricts. In distant vision and dim light, the dilator pupillae, I say again, the dilator pupillae, made up of those radial muscles, contracts and the pupil dilates. So dilator pupillae contracts, think of dilation of pupils, allowing more light to enter. Please write this down. So the sympathetic fibers control the pupillary dilation. I repeat, sympathetic fibers control pupillary dilation. That's important to know. In case you don't get what I'm getting at is, the sympathetic nervous system is, of course, that accelerator. That speeds up. This is what is in control, of course, by way of that fight or flight system. The parasympathetic fibers control constriction. I repeat, parasympathetic nervous system controls constriction. In other words, I'll speak to the parasympathetic nervous system as being that that slows, or even being called that rest and digest system. So changes in pupil size may also reflect our interests and emotional reactions. 
pupils often dilate when you see something appealing to you all. Well, very same way when you feel fear. And during problem solving, such as uh, computing your taxes. And that, of course, it says to make your eyes get bigger and bigger and bigger. On the other hand, boredom or viewing something unpleasant causes people to, to constrict. So if you are bored right now, please take a break from your notes. Not a long break, but a small break, and then get right back at it. So although our irises come in different colors, they contain only brown pigment. When they have a lot of pigment, the eyes appear to be brown or even black. If the amount of pigment is small and restricted to the posterior surface of the iris, the unpigmented parts scatter and the shorter wavelengths of light, and the eyes appear to be blue, green, or gray. And most newborn babies' eyes are slate gray or blue because their iris pigment is not yet developed. So let's get to that inner layer, the third layer, called the retina. And before I get to the retina, let me go back and go to our anterior and posterior chamber. So the anterior cavity of the eye between the cornea and lids is, is filled excuse me, with the thing called the aqueous humor. So this aqueous humor is what circulates from this chamber through the pupil and, of course, the circular opening of the center of the iris. And then it goes into the anterior chamber. The aqueous humor fills the space, providing nutrients and maintaining the shape of the front of the eye. The lens, as it states, is a transparent biconvex structure that lies behind the iris. It's elastic and then held in place by suspensory ligaments of the ciliary body, and it helps us to focus rays and change the shape for long distance viewing accommodation. So this deals with what we see and how we see. Everything you see will not necessarily be right in front of you. So we must have, we, we must change to focus. So focusing on close vision, focusing for close vision. So light from objects less than six meters away, it diverges as it approaches the eye and comes to a focal point farther from the lens. For this reason, close vision demands that the eye make active adjustments. To restore focus, three processes must occur simultaneously. It's called accommodation of the lenses, constriction of the pupils, and convergence of the eyeballs. So this accommodation refers to your lenses. It's the process that increases the refractory power of the lens by way of those ciliary bodies pulling to contract anteriorly pulling the anteriorly pulling toward the pupil inward and what happens is it no longer stretches and the elastic lens recoils and bulges providing a shorter focal length for a near point of vision meaning the the maximum bulge the lens can achieve in young adults with an emotropic vision the near point is approximately 10 centimeters or 4 inches from the eye. It's closer in children and gradually recedes with age, which is why you may have seen someone older than you reading something, such as a newspaper, at an arm's length farther away from their face. So the gradual loss of accommodation with age reflects the lens's increasing elasticity. And in many people over 50, the lens is non-accommodating in, in a condition known as presbopia meaning old person's vision. The iris, of course, as I mentioned earlier, controls the amount of light entering the eye. And we've already gotten to the pupil and the way in which constriction occurs. From here, I'd like to get to, I guess I'll just stay here for just a moment. Make sure you review this. I, I gave it to you moments ago about how the parasympathetic nerve fibers cause the sphincter pupillae muscles to contract. And of course, the pupil constricts the pupil constricts bright light, parasympathetic. On the converse, sympathetic nerve fibers innervate the dilator pupae, pupillae, excuse me, and then of course the muscle contracts. So with that, the pupil dilates. This is very, very important in dim light. 
So I already, already got into the aqueous humor moments ago. So what I'll now get to is that inner layer, the retina, that inner tunic. So the retina has that innermost layer, well, is that innermost layer, which develops from an extension of the brain. It contains, write this down, millions of photoreceptors that convert light energy, that transduce light energy, and other neurons involved in process, in processing the responses to light, and glia, support cells. So the retina consists of two layers, the outer pigmented layer and the inner neural layer. Although the pigmented layer and neural layers are very close together, they are not fused. So only the neural layer of the retina plays a direct, a direct role in vision. So the pigmented layer, that is the outer portion. It's pigmented, like those of the choroid, to absorb light and prevent it from scattering in the eye. And it also acts as phagocytes, participating in the photoreceptor cell renewal. So it stores vitamin A, which are needed by your photoreceptor cells. The neural layer, as it's composed primarily of three main types of neurons. We have ganglion cells, bipolar cells, and the photoreceptors. So signals are produced in response, I repeat, in response to light and spread from those photo photoreceptors to the next pigmented layer, to the bipolar cells, the innermost ganglion cells, where our action potentials are generated. So it's important to know this. So I'll go here and continue what I'm doing. So we have what is called the optic disc. Yeah, I'll go to the optic disc. It's called the optic disc because there are no photoreceptors there. And what I'm saying is, is it's where the optic nerve exits the eye. So as it happens, it's called the blind spot. I say again, the optic disc is also known as the blind spot. Well, the reason it's called the blind spot is because it lacks photoreceptors. So light that is focused on it cannot be seen. So we do not, it says we do not notice, typical which, those gaps in our vision because the sophistication of our brain filling in and dealing with that absence of input. And during lab, you will find your blind spot. And it's not anything that's hard to do. It's quite simple. You can do it right now, in fact. So next up, I say we have a quarter billion photoreceptors. I repeat, a quarter billion photoreceptors. That's a lot, if you ask me. And they're found, of course, as I mentioned earlier, in the, in the neural layer. And the two types are known as rods and cones. I repeat, we have a quarter billion of these things. To make it more interesting, rods are our dim light and peripheral vision receptors. This is on your test. They are more numerous and far more sensitive to light than the cones. However, they do not provide any sharp images or color vision. Hence, color disappears. And the edges of objects appear fuzzy in dim light and at the edges of your visual, visual field. So to say it a different way, when you think of rods, you should not think of color vision. You should think of vision that, of course, occurs with dim light and nothing at all to do with color. So you could write down to make a T-chart to compare. Or repeat, you can write down making a T-chart. You can write this down in the form of a T-chart comparing rods and cones. Rods on the left, cones on the right. So as you write it, rods, they have one visual pigment. And it's non-color vision. They are highly sensitive. And they function in dim light. We have low visual acuity by way of our rods. They are more numerous with, since you're, you're paying attention here, there are 20 rods for every cone. And they are mostly in the peripheral of the retina. 
those are the rods. Cones, however, are for color vision. There are three visual pigments for cones. There are three visual pigments for cones. For those who cannot wait, we have blue cones, green cones, and red cone. Red cones, excuse me. So yes, red, green, and blue. They have low sensitivity, and they function in bright light. They have high visual acuity, and you find this at the phobia. They are less numerous, and mostly in the central retina. And we'll do more with that here shortly. So to go back to where I was, in contrast, our cones are vision receptors for bright light and provide us with high resolution color vision. So if you look closely here, knowing what you now know, we have those rods which are more numerous than those cones. These are the photoreceptors. So going back to where we left off, we have what is called the macula lutea. The macula lutea. The macula lutea is that yellowish spot in the retina. So it's lateral to the blind spot in that oval region. And it has a pit within the center called the fovea centralis. So this, of course, allows that light to pass almost directly to the photoreceptors, rather than through several retinal layers. In other words, the fovea centralis has only cones, and the macula contains mostly cones. And from the edge of the macula toward the retina's periphery, cone density declines gradually, and the retina periphery contains mostly cones, which decrease in density from there to the macula. So only the fovea has sufficient cone density to provide detailed color vision. So anything you wish to view critically is focused on by the fovea because each fovea is only about the size of the head of a pen. Consequently, it is hard for us to visually comprehend a scene that is rapidly changing, such as when we drive in traffic. Our eyes must flick rapidly back and forth to provide the fovea with images of different parts of the visual field. So to make sure you don't forget it, the blood vessel supply and two from those two sources, they enter and leave via the optic nerve, meaning the very same spot. So physicians view these tiny blood vessels with the optimal scope. So the very same would be used in lab. So make sure you, of course, Present yourself to lab when we have lab. The retinal attachment is a pattern of vascularization. And what happens is that pigmented and neural layer separates or detaches, and the jelly like vitreous humor then, of course, begins to seep between them. And it can cause permanent blindness because it de deprives those photoreceptors of nutrients. So with retinal detachment, it usually happens when the retina is torn during a dramatic blow to the head, or when the head stops moving suddenly and then jerks back in the opposite direction, such as in bungee jumping. So it's been described as having a curtain pulled over your eye. If diagnosed early, with lasers, it can be, of course, attached. You mean reattached. So let's get to the internal chamber by way of its fluid. So, so the posterior cavity, which is enclosed by the lens, retina, and ciliary body, contains the vitreous humor, which I just mentioned. So it has a tremendous amount of water. And what the vitreous humor does is transmit light. It supports the posterior surface of the lens and holds the neural layer and retina firmly against the pigmented layer. And it contributes to the intraocular pressure that helps counteract the pulling forces of those extrinsic eye muscles. So as I put it that way, I'll now get to what happens when the pressure changes. So if drainage of the aqueous humor is blocked, the fluid can back up and become clogged, such as if you had in the sink maintenance before. So pressure within the eye may increase to dangerous levels. 
And if it happens, they can compress the retina and optic nerve, and a condition that is called glaucoma ensues. The eventual result is blindness, unless the condition is detected and treated early. Unfortunately, many forms of glaucoma steal sight slowly and so painlessly that people do not realize they have a problem until that damage has been done. So a late sign of glaucoma includes seeing a halo around lights and even blurred vision. Glaucoma examinations are quite simple to do, and this is by checking the intraocular pressure. This is done by, of course, that puff of air at the cornea and measuring the corneal deformation or deflection. So the exam should be done yearly by age 40. And typical of which, this happens likely when you see your eye doctor, if ever you go. Up next, I'll be at the cataract. So the cataract is a clouding of the lens that causes the world to appear distorted, even if seen through a frosted glass. Some cataracts are congenital, but most result from age-related hardening and thickening of the lens. It can also be a secondary consequence of diabetes mellitus, heavy smoking, or even frequent exposure to intense sunlight. So oxidative stress and metabolic changes in a deeper lens promote the clumping of those crystalline proteins, which of course are transparent, that form the body of the lens, or what of course may be why. So unexpectedly, supplementation with the antioxidant vitamin C may actually increase cat cataract formation. So please protect your eyes. So if in fact this has occurred, that lens can be removed and an artificial lens can be implanted to save the person's sight. So refraction is nothing more than the bending of light that occurs when those light waves pass at an angle. So focusing bends light so the image falls on the fovea centralis. So convex versus concave lenses. So light is focused by a convex lens and of course it bends or refracts light to converge at that focal point. So a concave lens causes light waves to diverge instead of converge, which is the case in a convex lens. So if you look closely, this shows how light that enters the eye is refracted by a convex surface of the cornea and the convex surface of the lens. So as you look closely, you can see that the light, the light enters into the eye from there and there and the image is focused on the retina that is upside down and reversed. The correction is done quite quickly, I say, by your visual cortex. Utterly amazing. Fraction disorders. It may be that someone may very well have what is called nearsightedness. That means they have a myopic eye. So to correct it, a concave lens moves that focal point further back. The eyeball is too long in that case. In the event that someone has what is called a hyperopic eye, a hyperopic eye or hyperopia, that means, of course, that they are farsighted. Their eyeball is too short. A convex lens can move that focal point forward. And, of course, an emetropic eye is normal, but the focal point is on the retina itself. So I've done rods and cones. Rods, of course, are there for no color vision, only shades of gray. Cones are there. And they do use, of course, three different light-sensitive pigments, erythrolobe, chlorolobe, and cyanolobe. This shows, yet again, another depiction of rods and cones. So the visual pigments. I've already gone through rod and cone vision. But do keep in mind that they have differing thresholds for activation. Rods are very sensitive, meaning they respond to very, very, very thin light. They have a single photon, making them best suited for night vision and peripheral vision, as opposed to cones, which need bright light to be activated, i.e. that low sensitivity, but react more rapidly. They react, react more rapidly. 
So cones have, of course, one of those, have one of the three pigments in it that, of course, give us the vision we do indeed love and see. Visual pigments. So we have those visual pigments known as rhodopsin, or visual purple, and the iodopsins, the iodopsins. So what happens is those photoreceptors that translate light coming in to electric signals, the key to light-absorbing molecule is called retinol. So retinol combines with proteins called the opsins, and they form four types of visual pigments. So depending on the type of opsin to which it's bound, retinol absorbs different wavelengths of the visual spectrum, of the visual light spectrum, excuse me. So the cone opsins, they differ from both. They differ both from the opsin of the rods and from one another. So the naming of the cones reflect the colors, or the wavelengths rather, of light that that cone variety absorbs best. So blue cones respond to a, an approximate 420 nanometers, and that's the wavelength in nanometers. Green light responds to wavelengths of approximate 530 nanometers, and red light, red cones, excuse me, respond to wavelengths at or close to 560 nanometers. So it's asked, how do we see colors besides blue, red, and green? It's because of the overlap of the spectrum. So since the spectra overlap, our perception of intermediate hues, such as yellow, orange, and purple, results from different activation of more than one type of cone at the same time. So yellow light will simulate both red and green cone receptors. But if the red cones are simulated more than the green cones, we see orange instead of yellow. And when all cones are simulated equally, we see white. So color blindness is an X-linked condition, an inherited X-linked condition. And it is estimated that up to 10% of males have some form of color blindness. In other words, it's linked on the X chromosome. And since males have one X chromosome, if they have at least one recessive allele, they are colorblind. So the most common type of colorblindness is red-green colorblindness, resulting from a deficit or absence of either red or green cone pigments. So red and green are seen as the same color, and either red or green, depending upon the, the pigment that's present. So many colorblind people are unaware because they have learned to rely on other hues, such as those different intensities. So retinol is rated directly to vitamin A, and it's made from vitamin A. So the cells of the pigment layer absorb vitamin A from the blood and serve and serve as that local vitamin A depot for both rods and cones. So retinol can assume a variety of three-dimensional forms called an isomer. So what I'm getting to is this. In the presence of light, rhodopsin will decompose into two parts. Let's get to how these parts work. The way it happens is that it triggers and decomposes, meaning the presence of light, rhodopsin, into retinol and opsin. Period. And I guess I'll get a bit more into that to make this make better sense. To make it make better sense by way of this thing called phototransduction. To better explain this, it's called phototransduction, the process by which light energy is converted into a greater receptor potential, and it begins when a visual pigment captures a photon of light. So the visual pigment of rods is that deep purple, or even some have called it visual purple, rhodopsin. So what happens is rhodopsin molecules, which are arranged in those membranes, have thousands of disks. So the first thing that happens is you must have rhodopsin to form and accumulate it. So rhodopsin forms and it's accumulated in the dark. Vitamin A is then oxidized and isomerized. And then combined with opsin to form rhodopsin. See again. To get the pigment, meaning rhodopsin is formed and accumulates in the dark. It happens by oxidizing vitamin A and isomerizing it 
to, of course, an 11 cis retinol form, and then it's combined with opsin to form rhodopsin. Pigment bleaching, of course, that you all I know are quite, I say quite intimate with, is what happens when rhodopsin absorbs light. So retinol then changes to a trans isomer. And this is what bleaches that pigment. So once the light struck all trans retinol detaches from opsin, enzymes with the pigment epithelium reconvert to its 11 cis isomer. Then retinol, of course, it says, has its heads homeward again to the photoreceptor cells out of segments. So the breakdown and regeneration of the visual pigments in cones is essentially the same for rhodopsin. However, cones are about 100 times less sensitive than rods, which means they can take a higher or brighter intensity of light to activate cones. So I'll now get to light and dark adaptation. Rhodopsin is quite sensitive, amazingly sensitive it states. So even starlight bleaches, bleaches, I repeat, even starlight bleaches some of its molecules. So as long as the light is low intensity, relatively low rhodopsin bleaches, and the retina continues to respond to light signal. However, in high light intensity, there is a whole cell bleaching of the pigment, rhodopsin bleaches as fast as it is, excuse me, as fast as it is reformed. So at this point, the rods are non-functional, but the cones still respond. Hint, retinal sensitivity automatically adjusts to the amount of light present. So amazing. We have what is called stereoscopic vision, and it happens because we have two eyes and giving us, of course, slightly different retinal images from the eyes. So I'll get to a light adaptation, continue where I was with light and dark adaptation. What happens is we move from darkness into bright light, such as leaving a movie matinee. I love those matinees. The momentarily dazzled. All we see is white light because the sensitivity of the retina is still set for dim light. So both rods and cones are strongly simulated and large amounts of visual pigments break down almost instantaneously, producing a flood, I repeat, producing a flood of signals that accounts for the glare. So under those conditions, compensations occur. The rod system turns off, and all of the transducens, excuse me, that pack up and move to the inner segment, uncoupling rhodopsin for the, from the rest of the transduction cascade. So without transducin in the outer segment, the light hitting rhodopsin cannot produce a signal. So I'll put it this way. Within about 60 seconds, the cones, initially overexcited by bright light, are sufficiently desensitized to take, to take over and visual acuity and color vision continue to improve for the next five to 10 minutes. For the next five to 10 minutes. Light adaptation relieves retinal sensitivity and rock function, but then visual acuity. Excuse me, I'm sorry for the airplane. I am, yes, I'm not inside right now. I'm putting the video. Dark adaptation is essentially the reverse of light adaptation. And it occurs when we go from a very well lit area into the dark. So initially, you see nothing but blackness. I mean, just imagine. I mean, you've done this many days of your lives. You've been there by the door, possibly, or just walked in from outside on a very sunny summer day. And you could not see a thing as soon as that door closed or as soon as that light turned off. It's because, one, our cones stop functioning in low-intensity light. And two, the bright light bleached our rod pigments and the rods are still turned off. But once we are in the dark, of course, rhodopsin accumulates. Here it goes. Transducins return, and they return to the outer segment, and retinal sensitivity increases. So dark adaptation is much, much slower than light adaptation, and can go on for hours and hours. However, there is usually enough rhodopsin within 20, 20 to 30 minutes to uh, allow adequate dim light vision. So this is how you can see around the house or see around wherever you are with that very dim light without the lights being on. So during both light and dark adaptation, those reflective changes occur in pupil size. Bright light shining in one or both eyes constricts both, I repeat, bright light shining in one or both eyes constricts both pupils, elicited by the pupillary and consequential light reflexes. And the pupillary reflexes are mediated by the protective nucleus of the midbrain and by 
perilous, sympathetic notes, fires, fighters. Please remember this for the next chapter, being chapter 11. So in dim light, the pupils dilate, allowing more light to enter the eye. Make sure you all review, take time to go through what is called nyctalopia, nyctalopia, nighttime blindness, and retin retinitis pigmentosa, retinitis pigmentosa. And that's a group of degenerative retinal diseases that destroy the glides. So please take some time to review nyctalopia and retinitis, retinitis pigmentosa. So I've already mentioned our stereoscopic vision because of our two eyes. So from here, I'll just keep on going to visual pathways. The visual pathways. You'll get to this a bit in lab, or at least I would like to. What happens with our visual pathways is the axons of the ganglion cells in the retina leave the eyes, forming the optic nerves. So we have that X-shaped optic chiasma. You may remember the term chiasma from learning about the process of meiosis and even chiasmata, the cross. So what happens is those fibers, they leave from the medial aspect of each eye and then cross over to the opposite side and then continue via the optic tract. So what I'll say about this is just make sure you know that that information goes from this eye on the anatomical left-hand side and the fibers then move back, cross the chiasma, and go to the anatomic right side of the body, as you see there. As you see there. The optic chiasma. Life span changes. So as we age, things change. As things change, I say one of the bigger things that does change Lifespan changes. One of the bigger things that changes is our ability to see. By age 40, a book may need to be held farther and farther away from the body. And please, class, read your textbook. Please, class, read your textbook. You may even begin to have floaters seen, develop cataracts and glaucoma. And class, please look up and review macular degeneration. Mac, mac D, as some may call it. It's called macular degeneration. Your eyes may also begin to dry. By the age 50 class, it states that senses of smell and taste may also begin to diminish, reflecting, of course, the anosmia, a loss of those olfactory receptors I mentioned in the prior lecture. By age 60, a quarter of the population experiences noticeable hearing loss. I did say it, noticeable hearing loss. And from ages 65 to 74, the percentage reaches a third. So half of all people over age 85 cannot hear adequate, adequately. And the age-related hearing loss may be the result of decades of the cumulative damage to those sensitive hairs of the spiral organ in the internal ear, becoming more and more difficult to hear high pitches, as well as those particular sounds such as f, j, s, s t, and sh, and th, and z, and ch. Yes, those sounds. So hearing loss may, of course, be due to degeneration or failure of the neural pathways to the brain. This condition is called presbycusis, and it may affect the ability to understand speech. So with vision, if your eyes become dry, meaning it's a person having dry eyes, having too few, too few tears or poor quality tears, it can lead to itchy and burning eyes and even diminished vision. And too many tears can result from an oversensitivity to environmental effects such as the intensity of light, wind, and change in temperature. So I spoke to floaters, meaning if a person sees small specks moving in their field of vision, it's because of those crystal-like deposits in their vitreous humor. And from here, it just mentions that several conditions may affect us as we age. So just please, class, take care of yourselves. Turn the music down, I say. And you, someone may ask, turn it down for what? Turn it down to protect your hearing. If you all have any questions, 
please feel free to email me or call my office at the number and make sure that you all are preparing well to do well in your final exam, which is worth 20% of your grade. If I can help you, class, let me know. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and prepare well for class. This has been your instructor, Skylar Huff.